is a research coordinator of Angeles University Foundation College of Nursing. Please welcome Mr. Doroteo S. Dizon. Our second judge is a fellow Royal Institute in Nursing, a registered nurse, and is a doctor of philosophy. He is a research and linkages coordinator of the College of Nursing at San Beda University, Metro Manila. Welcome, Dr. Rudolf Seymour Kirby P. Martinez. The third judge is a faculty of Philomer Christian University, a research coordinator, head of uh, FCU, Ethics Review Committee for Research, and graduated with Master's of Arts in Nursing here at CPU in 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Agnes June Limaco Custodio. Fourth judge is the Dean of the College of Nursing of West Visaya State University. Let us welcome Dr. Rosana Grace de la Riarte. Last but not least, our fifth judge is the Dean of the College of Health and Allied Medical Professions. Let's welcome Ms. Sofia Cosette P. Monteblanco. The guidelines for video presentations are, presenters should be officially registered for the conference. Presentation should be in MP4 format and should be given on or before 5 o'clock p.m. on January 21, 2020. 20. Should be given via email at cpunursingseminars at gmail.com and will be preloaded to a computer that will be used during the presentation. Presenters should be at the hall 20 minutes before the presentation. Font size should be readable. Presenters shall check their files 10 minutes before the entire presentations. Each presentation will be given 10 minutes for question and answers after the presentation. Timekeepers may terminate the presentations that exceed their allotted time. A card will be flashed indicating that only five and three minutes left as well as the end of presentation is uh, uh, done. Suggested format for the video inclusion is title, authors, address, tel telephone number, contact information, email, disclaimer, introduction, methodology, results, discussions, conclusions, recommendations, acknowledgement, and references. Changes cannot be made to presentations once the deadline has passed. Criteria for judging a video presentation will be rated according to use of resources during research and note-taking, content and organization, use of media like music, voiceover, and graphics, teamwork or participation for a total of 12 points. Are we ready for the presentation? Okay, presentation number one is entitled Quality of Work Life of Public School Nurses in the Schools Division of Iloilo. Quality of work life among public school nurses in schools division of Iloilo. School nurses play a crucial role in the provision of comprehensive health services to the school population. Studies have documented the positive impact of school nursing. As school nurses perform their roles often independently in the field and given their large caseloads, high levels of motivation are needed to serve this role. Understanding their work conditions and sources of contentment at work are necessary to attract and foster commitment in the field of school nursing. Among the many nursing specialties, research among school nurses is not given much attention. This study aimed to determine the quality of work life of public school nurses in the school's division of Iloilo and whether significant differences exist when grouped according to certain social, demographic, and work-related characteristics. 
This study utilized a descriptive cross-sectional research design participated by 57 public school nurses. Self-reported data were gathered utilizing the adapted version of Walton Quality of Work Life Scale with a reported Cronbach's Alpha of 0.6. Pertinent permissions to conduct the survey were secured from the division heads. All statistical analysis was aided by SPSS version 23. Descriptive statistics were used to describe the data, while Man Whitney U test and Cruz Hal Wallace test were used to test for differences after the malady of distribution was assessed. This study found that the majority of school nurses were young adults, females, married, and with bachelor's degree. Moreover, majority worked as a public school nurse for less than one year. All public school nurses were employed as nurse to permanent employees with a salary grade of 15. This study also found that overall, public school nurses had a high quality of work life. This study demonstrated that public school nurses had the highest quality of work life in terms of space that work occupies in their life, indicating work-family life balance. However, among the eight subscales, opportunities of work and social integration of work have the lowest mean scores. Previous researches on the quality of work life of school nurses in USA and Poland have similar results with this study. Comparing the findings of this study with the quality of work life of hospital nurses in other countries or elsewhere, the result of this study suggests that school nurses have better quality of work life than hospital nurses. Staff nurses in Egypt and South Ethiopia had a low level quality of work life. Results of studies in India, in Iran, and Bangladesh revealed moderate level quality of work life. Findings of other researchers in the Philippines also disclosed that staff nurses in Samar, Philippines were slightly unsatisfied with their job. The result of the study provides insights that the school work setting is different from the hospital work environment. Public school nurses deal with promotive and preventive aspects of health with less direct supervision from physicians. Moreover, public school nurses have regular working hours compared to the shifting work schedule of hospital nurses. The results of this study also revealed no significant differences in the quality of work life of public school nurses when classified according to their sex, marital status, educational attainment, and length of work experience. However, quality of work life was significantly higher for middle to older adults compared to young adults. The older the nurses, the more they appreciate working in a public school setting. It was earlier asserted by past researchers that mature nurses have better job satisfaction, productivity, and commitment to the organization. This study concludes that public school nurses have high quality of work life and age is a significant factor related to their quality of work life. Nevertheless, opportunities at work and social integration are perceived to be of the least quality aspects of public school nurses' work life. This study provides evidence that can enlighten school leadership and policy makers to devise ways of improving the quality of work life of school nurses. Public school nurses must be provided with added opportunities for continuous professional development and be given more chances for better social integration to further improve the quality of work life of the nurses tasked to ensure healthy school population. May I call on the researchers of presentation number one to come up the stage for the question and answer portion.
Okay. So is there any question from the panel of judges? Hello. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, researchers. Good Congratulations afternoon. for your video presentation. Uh, there are some things that I would like to ask regarding your presentation. You are uh, you are using an adapted. You used an adapted instrument. Yes, ma'am. Uh, which did you have the permission of the author? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you pretest the instrument? considering that there may be some cultural differences because this is an international or a U.S. instrument and you apply it in the Philippine setting, were you able to pretest the instrument? It has been evaluated by the thesis panel, ma'am. Research panel? Yes, yes ma'am. By the research panel. Uh, did you have the reliability test because you mentioned about Cronbach? Kron Actually, ma'am, the study was, uh, we believe that the study, the, the instrument is valid and reliable within the uh, cultural, uh, culturally valid for the Filipino population, given that it was um, assessed by the panel of, uh, with the thesis panel, the research panel, and as well as to ensure that uh, the clarity of the instrument and can be understood by the school nurses, we pilot tested it among five um, school nurses first before full scaling the full administration of the survey. And the, however, uh, the Cronbox Alpha was reported by the original scale um, developer, which is 0.96. Okay. How about significance level? You had tests of differences. Yes, ma'am. What significance level did you use? Because it was not mentioned in your video. Uh, significant level of 0 0.05, ma'am. Uh, findings um, is considered significant if the alpha level is um, below 0 0.05. Below 0 0.05. Yes, ma'am. So that was the significance level that yes, you used, 0 .05. Alpha level, of Alpha level 0 .05. 0 .05, okay. which is um, acceptable for social research. Okay, so thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to commend the group thank for you. focusing your attention on our public school nurses. Thank you. My, my question runs this way. You stated in your recommendation that you wanted the quality of work life of your public school nurses to be improved. Which aspect of their life, quality of life, are you focusing on in terms of improvement? Because the statement is very generic. I would like to have more concrete uh, recommendations on areas to be improved on. Uh, we believe that, um, as stated in our results, there are, there's a high level of quality of work life. However, um, among the eight subscales, they had lowest quality of work life, although high, in the areas of social integration and opportunities provided at work. That's why, ma'am, as part of our recommendation, we are recommending that school leadership and policymakers should devise ways in promoting, uh, take for example, to provide school nurses with more opportunities for professional development like take for example they should be supported with when attending such conferences or other continuing professional development uh, so that they can improve their um, the, that aspect of their quality of work life okay you said it's on social integration yes ma'am and you are telling me about professional development uh, so what there aspect were, in social integration there were two social integration means that they are uh, they had lowest social integration uh, in terms of 
of the eight subscales because um, they are working independently in the field. They less, uh, they often work alone in the field providing healthcare services. That's why uh, they are not able to work with, with their supervisors and even with their co-staff nurses. So that's why I think it's inherent with a, uh, with a, uh, with a, uh, with the fields of specialty of school nursing. Uh, that's why it can be the uh, school policymakers may devise ways on, I, I believe that they have to be given more opportunities to work together, to bond together, or team building activities, although they meet at least once a month for every year. I know, every month, I mean. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so is there any question from the audience? Okay, do you still have a question? Okay. Just a clarification. Uh, how many participants do you have? 57? 57 out of 62. All, all of those 57 are public school yes, sir. health nurses. Are they working under the DOH, the LGU, or the DepEd? Dep they are under the Department of Education, sir. Oh, now that explains all of them are permanent, all of them have the same salary grade. Yes, Division of Iloilo. 57, and if you have noticed in the results, um, there, most of the public school nurses have less than one year of experience because during the conduct of survey, it was only the time that the DepEd hired more school nurses. And with, there is a bill in the Congress to hire more public school nurses to have at least one public school nurses in every in every school. So I think this, this study would help to support that bill. Thank you. So are there any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, clarification, then. It's not a, actually a question. Regarding the treatment of your variables, uh, especially in the in getting the difference, uh, why did you choose uh, difference, not relationship? Uh, where in fact you are dealing with the word quality of life, uh, then uh, it's more of a uh, qua uh, it's not a quantity uh, quantity. It's not a number. So, but you are trying to compare them in numbers because you are talking about the differences. Uh, that's why you made use of the Kruskal Wallis uh, and uh, the the other statistical tool. Upon testing for the normality of the data, sir, it appeared that it is skewed or it is not uh, normally distributed. That's why we use non parametric tests such as Manu Bitney and Chris Wallis. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. correct. I, my question has something to do with why get the difference, not the relationship. It has something to do with journal hypothesis. You are dealing with uh, uh, the word quality of life, so, but you have treated them as numbers. That's why uh, you, were, uh, you were able to uh, answer your differences, not re relationship. Yes, sir. Uh, it was not relationship. And I believe that quality could be quantitatively assessed and as well as qualitatively assessed. On this study, it's quantitatively assessed as part of our de uh, research design. Okay, thank you very much for that. A quality you, that was quantitatively assessed. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you, presenters. Presentation number two is entitled Effectiveness of Virtual Reality Animation on the Pain Level of Pediatric Patients Undergoing Subcutaneous Injection.
an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage as defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain. Virtual reality, an artificial environment created with the use of software and virtual reality devices. As part of the interaction, visual perspectives are responsive to changes in movement and interactions mimicking those experiences in the real world. Hoofman studies have shown that virtual reality simulation reduced pain 35% to 50% decrease in perceived pain on burn patients. Rubnik in 2018 used virtual reality in evaluating fear using the McMurdy's Children's Fear Scale and the One Baker Pain Scale for participants ages 6 to 17 having immunization. Study shows 94.1% of decreased in pain and would likely to use virtual reality in their next immunization. Jones, Moore, and Chu investigated the impact of a virtual reality application for chronic pain. 30 participants with various chronic pain conditions were offered a 5-minute session using a virtual reality application. Pain from pre-session to post-session was reduced by 33% and also by 60% during the pre-session and during the VR session. Studies have shown that virtual reality experience was found to provide a significant amount of pain relief and is a promising effect as an on-pharmacological treatment for pain. However, there is no study about the use of virtual reality among pediatric patients undergoing subcutaneous injection, hence this study was conducted. Objectives of the study This study aimed to determine the effectiveness of virtual reality animation on the pain level of pediatric patients undergoing subcutaneous injection. Specifically it aimed to determine the pain level of pediatric patients undergoing subcutaneous injection on a routine injection procedure. Determine the pain level of pediatric patients undergoing subcutaneous injection with virtual reality animation. Determine if there is a significant difference in the pain level of those pediatric patients with virtual reality animation and those under routine injection procedure. The Gabe Control Theory This theory explains that before messages are transmitted into our brains it passes by nerve gates, and these gates control whether the signal could pass through or not. Some filtered pain messages are minimized or sometimes they are not felt at all. This theory also states that the attention a person gives on pain determines the level of pain they perceive. Therefore, if a person is distracted, the level of pain that they receive will be lessened compared to those who are not distracted. According to this theory pain signals do not reach the brain due to injured tissues. These signals need to encounter some neurological gates at the spinal cord level and these gates decide if these pain signals should go to the brain or not. Gate control theory explains that, when pain signal through the gate pain will be felt but it will be less excruciating or won't be felt at all when the gate will reject the signal to pass through. This is an experimental study using the post-test only control group design. In a post-test only control group type of research design, the researcher assigns the subjects and groups randomly. The experimental group receives the experimental treatment and the control group receives the routine treatment or the standard procedure that a post-test is given to both of the groups. For behavioral parameters, the researchers utilize face, legs, activity, cry, console ability scale or flat behavioral pain assessment scale to determine the facial expression, leg and arm movements, activity, cry and console ability of the patient was based on the FLACC criteria table. Before conducting the study, the researchers consulted a pain doctor to explain how to assess and utilize the pain level of pediatric patient using the flat behavioral pain assessment scale. 30 pediatric patients that are qualified in the inclusion criteria was selected randomly. 15 as the experimental group and 15 as the control group. The subjects in the experimental group were placed in a comfortable position while watching to a virtual reality animation for 3 minutes. The control group did not receive the virtual reality animation simulation. Standard routine injection procedure continued with the control group. To ensure that the rights and welfare of the subjects is protected, the study was fully discussed with the subjects. An informed consent was given to the parents to be signed when they consented their child to participate in this study. The data was encoded and analyzed using Statistical Package for Social Sciences SPSS, version 25. Our results have shown that Almost one half, which is 46.7% of the pediatric patients who had the routine procedure did not present with any pain expression. In terms of legs and arms, half, which is 53.3% had normal position or was relaxed during the routine procedure. 
for the quiet consolability, 6 out of 10, or, 60%, did not cry and was relaxed during the routine procedure. The respondents that have used virtual reality device have shown the two-thirds which is, 66.7% of the respondents did not present any pain expression. Whereas, among those who experienced virtual reality, 8 in every 10 or, 80.0% of the children appeared relaxed. The assessment for the cry had increased to 100% and is for consolability majority or, 73.3% of the patients have shown a relaxed state. The mean scores of those who underwent routine procedure is higher. 3.67 compared to the mean scores of the pediatric patients who had virtual reality during the injection. 1.47. When the difference was tested using man the u test for two independent samples, it yielded a value of 0.098. This is statistically insignificant because the p-value, 0.098, is more than the level of significance, 0.05. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, there is no significant difference on the level of pain among patients who had the routine procedure and virtual. We recommend to the healthcare professionals including nurses and pediatricians, not to employ virtual reality animation as non-pharmacological pain intervention, since it has shown that some of the patients benefit on the pain experience undergoing injection. To the parents and the respondents of this study, we do not recommend the use of virtual reality animation in routine injection procedure like subcutaneous injection because it is proven in this study that it does not lessen the patient's experience of pain. To the Department of Health personnel, we recommend not to consider the effectiveness of this kind of intervention as one of their non-pharmacological pain intervention to pediatric patients undergoing routine injection procedure. To future researchers, it is recommended that this study should be used as a reference for further study regarding distraction techniques for pain. It could also be used as a reference for future studies regarding the utilization of virtual reality animation. May I call on the researchers of presentation number two to come up the stage. I would like to welcome questions from the panel of judges. Good, Good afternoon. So Good afternoon. again, congratulations for your research. Now, I, I have some clarification or clarificatory notes. Number one, how old was your patients? Uh, so our patients or our respondent, sir, was three to seven years old. Seven. Three, three to seven. Three to seven. Yes, sir. Three to seven. Okay, it makes clear. Uh, since they are three to seven, you utilize the flock behavioral scale. Yes, sir. Why use the flock behavioral scale when there are other modes of measuring pain in a varied age group of three to seven years old? Okay, um, so uh, we tried using a Wong Baker's pain scale, sir, for the assessment of pain. But our study utilizes the use of virtual reality, wherein it blocks the facial expression of our patients. So we can uh, really properly assess the facial expression. I mean, like the, the pain level um, by the use of facial expression. That is why we use the flag scale, because the flag scale um, assesses the fish, uh, face, the legs, the arms, the cry, and the consolability of the patients. Uh, another one. May I ask what is the context of them? Why are they having subcutaneous injection? Uh, Was it during a routine procedure, during vaccination, or during? Immunization. Uh, yeah. um, we went to Zaraga to get a um, school-based immunization for the grade one and grade two students. Grade one and grade two? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But grade three to seven? Yes, sir. Because some of the grade two students, sir, are still in seven years old. So we based on the rural health unit. 
yung, yung mga bata, grade 1 and grade 2. Yes, so, ilan yes, taon sir. sila? Me, me uh, three years old, sabi nila. Is it, am I right? Uh, three years old. How, how old were your participants? They are three to seven three to years seven. old. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, f uh, the three to seven years old, sir, is um, only in our inclusion in criteria. But um, the respondents that we have had is um, ages six and seven years old, which is grade 1 and grade, grade 2, sir. Grade. So, she is declared because she is the one who is actually So, six to seven years yes, old. Uh, you, you, you are aware, although though that six to seven year old children, I'm a pediatric nurse, uh, six to seven year old children, and my major is pain management also. Six to seven years old children, you can actually directly ask them if it was painful using a varied way, using coins, using cards, using mm -hmm. stones. Yes, sir. Yeah. Maybe you can revisit. The, the the technique and last question yes sir uh, how did you choose the content of the VR uh, um, so th um, the video that we have used sir for our virtual reality is uh, SpongeBob uh, for the ride I mean like it's an animation wherein SpongeBob um, tries to distract the children the, the VR, was it functionally integrated into the process of the subcutaneous injection? Yes. Yeah, because, yes, sir. Yung, well, kung lalapin natin si SpongeBob, hawakan siya sa kanya yung ilalagay yung... Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is... Uh, about true experiment, okay? And if it's a true experiment, there should be three characteristics that we should observe. One is randomization. Yes, ma'am. Second is the presence of the control and experimental group. Yes, and the third is that one variable can be manipulated, okay? So how did you go about with your randomization oh, so um, random assignment of your um, cases no of yes, your participants in the experience in the experiment how did you assign them to the experimental group and to the control group wherein there was random assignment um, we that like uh, we designated like it's alpha is the alphabetical mom for, uh, for example the student number one we put it on the experimental group the student number two we put it on the control group so alternative yeah okay Oh, so you did it that way, okay? Yeah. My second concern is on the ethical considerations, the ethical aspects. We are dealing with three years old, seven years old. We are dealing with pediatric clients. Did you have your study, uh, did you submit your study for ethical review by the University Ethics Committee? Uh, yes, ma'am. Our study was uh, ethically reviewed by the Ethical Committee of the University, ma'am, before this study was conducted. Meron kayong University Ethics Committee? Do you have the Ethics Board? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. You have, but, uh, well, anyway. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have one. May I have a question? Yes, okay. yes ma'am. Um, in your recommendations, you mentioned that you will not recommend the use of visual, uh, virtual reality. Mm -hmm. uh, on what basis that you're not recommending the use of this method um, for pain? So, um, regarding the recommendations, ma'am. Um, so, in our study, um, first, um, we have to take into consideration that we have used the flag scale. So in the flag scale, we have five areas to assess. So during our 
I mean, like during the conduction of the study, um, we have obtained a result from the legs, or I mean, like the assessment of the legs, wherein it has um, given us a result um, that made virtual reality um, not recommend uh, not uh, recommended for patients. But, but for the leg, but that's uh, based on your statistical re result because that's the ultimate basis of the outcome of your study. So statistically, what was the result? Um, so statistically, the results of our study is, uh, has shown... Um, no difference. Not, yeah, it's not significant, ma'am. Not significant. So you will not recommend the use because it, there's no significant difference? Uh, yeah, so um, for our studies, um, we recommend, ma'am, the further studies to be conducted regarding the use of virtual reality in pain management, ma'am. Okay, so it's like you will not recommend for now until yes. further studies are yes, conducted. I would, I would rather have heard you say that rather than simply say not recommend yes, because you never know maybe in further studies. Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We are looking at a very sensitive variable, which is basically pain. No? Yes, Especially pain experienced by your, uh, your cases, aging seven and uh, eight. Three to seven, ma'am. Seven and eight. Six, uh, six and seven, ma'am. Uh, six and seven. Yes, ma'am. These are children. Yes, ma'am. When you conducted the study, was there a parent consent? And were the parents present? Yes. When yes, ma'am. Uh, when you did a study? Yes, yes ma'am. The parents were there. Okay. Since there are two groups, your experimental and your um, control group, yes, were they in the same environment when you conducted your study? I mean, are they in the same classroom? Is it with the same temperature and level of noise? The, uh, uh, I mean, these are, these are things which should have been considered yes, because in an experimental group, all the other variables extraneous to the study should also be controlled. So may I know what were some of your control uh, schemes when you conducted or when you gathered the data? Uh, okay, ma'am. So first, ma'am, um, we have taken into consideration the type of video simulation that we are going to use for uh, each of our patients or for both of the groups. And then next, we have also... And, and talking of your, and talking of your virtual reality animation, yes, what made you choose Spongebob? Um, so um, we have chosen Spongebob, ma'am, because um, as we have observed, um, Spongebob is a common or a famous um, a cartoon character that is um, often shown to television wherein children are familiar. familiar with. Your children, your pediatric patients, pediatric patients yes, are, were hospitalized? Uh, no, ma'am. No. So no. you conducted it in the community? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Are you aware that there are a lot of children who are not familiar with SpongeBob? So you should have, uh, you should have Sana try to look into which one is best. But anyway, it's already there. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And it will contribute to research data. No? So maybe we could look into, this is a very good study because we could have other virtual reality animation which could be used no? to, to know the effectiveness. No, of your uh, of your reality animation to the level of pain. No. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. And let me reiterate that it's one of our guidelines that each presentation will be given 10 minutes for questions and answers after the presentation. Presentation number three is entitled Life of the Unemployed, Uncovering the Lived Experiences of Retrenched Faculty Members.
people and work are intimately connected. A career can provide one with a sense of purpose and significance, a sense of determination, a means of social connection, and a source of fulfillment. Work provides one with a means in terms of salary and wages and to contribute to and provide for one's family and relationship maintenance. Retrenchment is a reality in workplace and more employees face retrenchment and life after retrenchment. Retrenched faculty members also undergo such experience. The switch from being employed to unemployed is change in itself and it certainly will cause changes whether for better or for worse in the life of people. Retrenchment may affect people differently due to varying backgrounds and situation. This study aimed to explore and interpret the meaning of the lived experiences of faculty members after retrenchment in a private university. Participants were chosen purposively and saturation principles were applied. Seven participants who were retrenched faculty members were interviewed. Data was analyzed using the Van Manen methodological interpretation and thematic analysis to categorize and discern patterns. In-depth interview was used to collect data. All interviews were audio taped, transcribed, and translated by the researcher. There were four major themes that emerged. The major themes were sets of various emotions, challenges, effect on relationships, support system, and coping strategies. The retrenched faculty members looked at the meaning of their lived experiences as the end of happiness, a feeling and sense of uselessness, end of career, an anticipated retirement, and valuable life lessons. experiences are true to those who have experienced such phenomenon. These findings cannot be generalized to all retrenched faculty members. The identified themes form the basis for the formulation of recommendation guidelines on the lived experiences of retrenched faculty members. recommended that they may carry out an analysis of alternative for retrenchment and ensure that all potential alternatives have been considered in order to avert retrenchment or reduce the number of faculty members affected. The faculty members may experience the same situation and can help themselves by seeking financial advice and counseling and engaging in activities that will promote self and professional growth. Lastly, this study may be used as a basis for other studies that would contribute to a better understanding of life after retrenchment, especially of faculty members. This can be used as a baseline for quantitative or mixed method research that can further validate the findings. I call on the presenter or the researcher of this pres presentation number three. And we would like to welcome questions from the panel of judges for just 10 minutes. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. Uh, some some clarificatory question. Uh, again, first and foremost, congrats for your for doing this research. Okay. Uh, number first question or first clarification: Why utilize phenom? Come again, sir. Why utilize the phenomeno phenomenology as your philosophical underpinning of this study? The philosophical underpinnings of this study. Okay, so this that study was based on the uh, work of uh, Martin Hidiger, um, interpretive phenomenology, which she developed from hermeneutics by uh, the philosophy of interpretation by um, studying the concept of um, being, uh, being there. Uh, we, I have made this clarification because when we talk about phenomenology, the main aim of a phenom study is to actually study a lived experience, an experience that you have actually gone through and changed your reality and view of life. The experience of being retrenched is more akin to a crisis phenomenon than a lived experience. Yeah. In crisis phenomenon, we cannot use the philosophy of phenom basically because all crisis phenomenon follows the same patterns. Kahit iniwan ka ng boyfriend, nawalan ng mahal sa buhay, na retrench, nasunugan, lahat yan crisis. So all of the patterns that you will see are almost the same. And they are predictable. The, the predictability of patterns is obvious in a crisis phenomenon. Although you can actually study them, you can, you can study them, you can study them utilizing a generic qualitative approach that is not phenom. Why am, I, why am I emphasizing? Your data is already there. Nagawa na siya. So, nasa na yung mga interviews nila. You can actually look at it again through the lens of a generic qualitative study. You try to understand ano yung mga patterns nilang nabuo without claiming these patterns as themes because that is only true for a phenom study. And in a phenom study, your main goal is to create the essence. Your essence must be unique. Hindi siya kapareho ng ibang phenomenon. Now, if you will utilize the essence of someone in a retrenchment, it's almost the same as all the crisis phenomenon's essence. But the intention of the study is good. The intention of the study is good. The reason for the existence of the study is good. Such um, um, point lang is there is, seems to be a mismatch with your goal and the process that you intend to use behind its philosophies. But it's good. Your data is there. Remember, in qualitative research, it's not yet finished until it is published. So you have a long, long way to actually revisit and revisit your things. Yeah. Yes, okay, I study is good. Okay. Uh, can I see? Um, congratulations, you know, there's always uh, a start. But I, I really appreciate because, you know, um, your research capability, you have to start you know, from somewhere when you do research, okay? And I hope you would be open to suggestions. No? Uh, the qualitative study can be more beautiful when presented using verbatim uh, responses like kung ano talaga yung ginawa nila, like kung interview sana, okay, and ma marinig natin yung bosses nila, and we feel how really it is that they are going through you know, during their retrenchment time, ganyan, mas maganda, you know, ma maka ano ka, maka, ibang sabi na I feel you, parang ganun, no? okay. yun dapat mo, mang, oh, makakonek ka, yun ang ating purpose when we present is a video, na your, your, judge, your audience would say, I feel you, no? okay. because kung ano talagang sinasabi nila. Okay, okay? noted, ma'am. Okay, but this is really a good start, no? this is yes. a good start. In, in qualitative, we call that as your resonance, the manner how you presented the paper, it resonated to the audience, although the audience did not experience the experience that you're presenting. So yung sinasabi ni Ma'am Bella na way, that's one way of being, having a good resonance, to let us hear the voices of your participant with their consent. Siyempre, kailangan silang kumayag, kasi baka kilala namin yung voices. Uh -oh. Kadalasan kasi, pumapayag naman sila kapag sabihin mo na ilalagay namin yung voices mo sa presentation na 
pahig naman sila. Basta walang muka. Basta boses lang. Okay? Again, these are suggestions for you yes. to improve on your research. At least you started somewhere. That's the good thing. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the judges? Okay. So thank you very much for the questions and the suggestions. Thank you very much, researcher. Presentation number four is entitled Predictors of Clinical Outcomes of Post-Cardiovascular Intervention Patients in a Selected Hospital in Iloilo City.
I call on the researcher of presentation number four. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I, I just would like to know if you have used uh, records review to get your data. Yes, sir. Retrospective charts review. Okay, so for how long? Uh, this is from January 2017 up until December of 2018, technically around two years of data sets. Okay, so wh what's the local of the study? Uh, you, uh, a local hospital in Iloilo that has a percutaneous coronary intervention capability private institution. Okay. So may I ask, what's the reason of conducting this study? Uh, my specialization is into predictive analytics. Even though we're nurses, uh, nursing informatics is my, my field of specialization. And I've seen uh, risk assessments, calculators applied to many already uh, procedures. And we've seen Euroscore applied in the open heart surgery. However, in terms of percutaneous or minimally invasive type of surgeries, equivalent to an open heart surgery, we have none yet for Philippine-based settings. So the primary goal of this uh, research is to establish whether or not Caucasian calculators will be applicable to Philippine ethnicities in determining mortality risk assessments. Uh, sorry, I was not able to see kung ilan yung uh, cases mo. How many cases? Uh, you this have? is a minimal, minimum requirements for the statistical analysis, 157, I think. But we were able to do around 173 chart reviews. What's the basis for the 157? Uh, the cases? two year analysis, uh, the two year total population. So you have a population of, then uh, you computed for the minimum number? Yes. Okay. Uh, you made use of the chi square value to get the uh, correlational values or the correlation between the variables? Uh, yes. So then after that, uh, did you use uh, regression formula? I'm sorry? Regression formula? Uh, in the regression formula, it used your Pearson's correlation coefficients for the logistic regression. I, I thought your study has something to do with prediction. Yes. I think it, uh, it's better that uh, you used uh, the regression formula to be able to isolate the uh, variables that are correlated Correct. already with the study. Correct. Mm -hmm. So initially, the preliminary step for the statistical analysis was to correct, uh, find first which variables are correlated into the, uh, which, which variables are correlated to the dependent variable and then add those particular variables into the regression model, correct. So who will benefit uh, from your study? Who will benefit from my study? Currently, um, imagine yourself or a patient coming inside the hospital going to a percutaneous coronary intervention without any thought or any knowledge as to what the outcome will be. So the primary um, recipient or benefactors of this study will be patients being able to know quanti quantifiably the outcomes of the coronary intervention. Secondly, cardiovascular or card cardio um, interventional cardiologists will also benefit from this, being able to appraise their patients better compared to non-quantifiable um, methods. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, I would like you to relate the results of your study in terms of implication to nursing practice and its usability to the people around here, to the students. I see. Um, because uh, I would like to congratulate you. The technicality of the study is very good, but I am more interested on how our student nurses could utilize uh, the findings. Definitely. Uh, currently, with the advent of the trans, uh, with minimally invasive surgery coming into Iloilo, uh, one of our local government 
hospital is already adopting angioplasties in the hospital setting, wherein it will allow our community for people who are suffering from heart diseases to be able to be treated there. In the application for nursing, uh, we will be able, uh, we have uh, an opportunity for service in the cath lab uh, field, wherein angioplasty is being done. And uh, if you are nurses, if we are nurses and we are taking care of these patients coming in into our care, um, being able to appraise them and give them education as to what are the parameters or predictors in terms of a good outcome and a bad outcome will be, uh, that's the, that's the main thought of it, being able to help your patients to, uh, to decide better whether or not the procedure will be good for them or not. What are your predictors for a good outcome? Um, interestingly, with the current uh, study that we had, as you can see, the Euroscore 2 overestimates mortality risk assessments compared to the actual mortalities. Euroscore predicted that there would be around 17% deaths. In actuality, there are only around 5% uh, of deaths. So with this current uh, uh, beta coefficients for the Caucasian models or uh, Caucasian-based calculator, we're saying that it overestimates mortality risk assessments. Interestingly, in the many factors that was examined, only NY or New York Heart Association classification of heart diseases is the only one that was um, correlated to mortality risk assessments. But in terms of another factor for clinical outcomes, which is, uh, which is length of stay, there were, even, there were more predictors there compared to mortality risks. Your predictors is length of stay. Uh, no, no. Uh, length of stay was the was part of the clinical outcomes. In clinical, no, sorry, clinical yes. outcomes. What other clinical outcomes were identified? Uh, for for mortality, ma'am, or for clinic for length of stay or for readmission? For mortality. For mortality, only NYHA scoring or the New York Heart Association classification of uh, angina. This, these things which you are, not, you are presenting are the nice-to-know uh, concepts in nursing. The nice-to-know concept. Because we said there are three, no? The, uh, the must-know, the good-to-know, and the nice-to-know. I, I appreciate the group for coming up with a study which is at the level of not only the must know but rather the nice to know concepts for student nurses thank you thank you uh, just a comment uh, you have a really good study but how i wish uh, those things that were asked were visible in the video that we don't need to ask them anymore like the number of participants it's very important uh, the rec recommendations I did not see the implications and recommendations that would have made it really complete but it's a good study thank you thank you very much researcher um, presentation number five is entitled Awareness and Attitude on HIV AIDS and Intention to Test Among Male Homosexuals in Iloilo City. Human immunodeficiency virus, also known as HIV, is a virus that weakens the immune system of those infected and leaves their bodies prone to infection. HIV is transmissible through blood, semen, vaginal fluids, and breast milk, and the risk factors of transmission include sharing of needles, breastfeeding, and most commonly, unprotected penetrative sex. Globally, approximately 36.9 million people are diagnosed with HIV as of 2017, with only three-fourths of these people being aware of their status. The vast majority of people diagnosed with HIV and AIDS live in low-income countries such as the Philippines. Nationally, the number of new infections has doubled in the past six years from an estimated 4,300 in 2010 to an estimated 10,500 in 2016. Of the total population, one-third still remains undiagnosed. According to statistics from March 2019, 65,463 have been recorded from 1984. While the Philippines has controlled the HIV epidemic among female sex workers, the country noted a shift in the epidemic in 2007. 
notably among male homosexuals. Data from 2016 showed that 83% of reported HIV cases occurred among males who have sex with males, with the majority occurring from 15 to 24 year olds. Only 35% had efficient knowledge on HIV transmission and prevention. Iloilo province ranked first in region six for the highest cases of HIV with 429 confirmed cases as of 2017, with approximately two people diagnosed every day with males having sex with males aged 25 to 35, making up most of this population. The notable rise in reported cases is attributable to the increased number of males having sex with males who are being tested. Despite this, many people still seem to fear testing. When every other country is decreasing in cases of HIV and AIDS, the Philippines is rapidly growing with an expected number of 300,000 cases nationwide by 2030 if awareness and information is not emphasized. The importance of testing has to be stressed because it is the best way to beat the transmission of HIV and AIDS. This study aimed to determine the level of awareness, attitude towards HIV and AIDS, and intention to test among male homosexuals in Iloilo City, as well as the relationship between these variables. This study is descriptive correlation which employs a one-shot survey design. This design seeks to collect data pertinent to the study by conducting an investigation of the study participants only once. The study population involves 100 self-identified male homosexuals between the ages of 18 to 30 years old. The survey was conducted in Iloilo City in order to attain the desired sample population. The sample was determined using snowball sampling design in order to acquire the data needed. The researchers used the questionnaire to gather data for the study. The questionnaire was divided into three parts, awareness on HIV and AIDS, attitude towards HIV and AIDS, and intention to test for HIV. The questionnaire was presented to and validated by experts on HIV AIDS and HIV testing who are also experts in the field of nursing and research prior to actual data collection. 61% of the respondents had an average level of awareness on HIV and AIDS, 12% of the respondents had a high level of awareness on HIV and AIDS, and 27% had a low level of awareness on HIV and AIDS. A high majority were aware of the meaning of HIV, its transmission through unprotected sex and blood, and the availability of voluntary testing. However, majority have wrongly perceived that HIV diagnosed women will always have HIV positive children, results are always accurate, and that it mostly affects heterosexual men. Majority of the respondents had negative attitude towards HIV and AIDS. A little over half of the respondents claimed that they would be ashamed to have themselves tested for HIV and would not tell others of their status if ever they were to test positive. Although majority of the respondents claimed that they would not disclose their status if they were to test positive for HIV, almost all believed that the people living with HIV should disclose their status. Majority of the respondents also claimed that they would be okay living with their condition if they were ever to test positive for HIV, and a large majority would submit themselves for treatment if they were to test positive for HIV. Majority of the respondents had high intention to test for HIV, while only a very small percentage had low intention to test for HIV. The remaining 38% had an average intention to test for HIV. The highest situation as to when the respondents would submit themselves for testing is if their employer required it. There is a moderate relationship between awareness on HIV and AIDS and attitude towards HIV and AIDS. Majority of respondents with low awareness on HIV and AIDS also had negative attitude towards HIV and AIDS, while those with high awareness on HIV and AIDS had positive attitude towards HIV and AIDS. Majority of homosexuals with low awareness on HIV and AIDS also had negative attitude towards HIV and AIDS, whereas majority of those with high awareness on HIV and AIDS also had positive attitude towards HIV and AIDS. There is a high correlation between awareness on HIV and AIDS and intention to test for HIV. Majority of the respondents with low awareness on HIV and AIDS had average intention to test for HIV. Majority of the respondents with average and high awareness on HIV and AIDS had high intention to test. There is a high correlation between attitude towards HIV AIDS and intention to test for HIV. Interestingly, those with positive attitude towards HIV and AIDS had positive intention to test for HIV, while a little bit more than half of the respondents with negative attitude towards HIV AIDS also had high intention to test for HIV. The following conclusions were drawn based on the result of the study. Number one, the respondents had an average level of awareness on HIV and AIDS. Two, the respondents had negative attitude towards HIV and AIDS. Three, the respondents had high intention to test for HIV. Four, awareness on HIV and AIDS has a substantial influence on attitude towards HIV and AIDS. Five, attitude towards HIV and AIDS has a substantial influence on intention to test for HIV. Six, awareness on HIV and AIDS has a substantial influence on intention to test for HIV. 
For recommendations, number one, to the healthcare professionals, it is recommended that health education be emphasized regarding the basics of HIV and AIDS in order to improve the awareness of the general public. Two, to the DOH personnel and community health nurses, conducting of awareness campaigns and EIC materials should be strengthened because homosexuals only have the average level of awareness on HIV and AIDS. Three, to the educational institutions, it is recommended that sex education should be emphasized in the current curriculum in order to further promote HIV awareness of the younger generations. Four, to future researchers, it is recommended to conduct further researches on HIV and AIDS in provincial areas and towns outside of Iloilo City to further enhance the scope of ranges covered by studies on HIV and AIDS. There is a need to step up efforts towards ending the spread of HIV and AIDS in the Philippines. This has to start with good awareness on HIV, HIV and the intent to have oneself voluntary tested. The country's views and opinions towards HIV also has to change for the betterment of our society and for people to be more open to controversial topics that may be considered taboo in a conservative nation. Prevention is the only option in fighting against the virus since after all, prevention is always better than the cure. Know the science, stop the stigma, and get yourself tested. Researchers number five, please come up the stage for the question and answer the portion. And would like to entertain questions from the judges. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Again, congratulations for your research. You have done a actually a timely research, a timely topic for research. Thank you. So uh, I I just have two, on my part, two clarification. Number one, the terminology that you utilize in your paper, you utilize male homosexual. The more politically correct term of addressing them is male who have sex with male, oh, okay. MSM. Because you, um, even though sexuality, uh, SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, is different ang MSM sa homosexual, but this homosexual is very derogatory. Okay, okay. so that one. Uh, okay. Use MSM instead of just male homosexuals. Okay, thank you. The next, was the tool translated or translated in, in the vernacular? Um, no, sir, it wasn't. So, it was used in toto. Wala kayong binago dun sa tool. Um, pardon, sir? Uh, wala kayong binago dun sa tool. Kung paano nyo nakuha sa internet, saka nyo siya ginamit, or was the tool created by the group? Um, it, it wasn't translated, sir. It was all in English. So, yeah. So, you just got a tool from the internet, oh, then you um, utilize it? Uh, it wasn't exactly um, a tool from the internet, but we made the questionnaire ourselves on the basic knowledge and stuff. It's researcher made. Ah, so the tool is researcher, was researcher made? Yes, sir. But we had it validated to a panel of validators who were experts on HIV. So you did face validity and internal validity of your tool? Uh, we reliability tested the tool. reliability, sir, and the validity. Okay. I have no other question. Ah, uh, Pahabol, did you, did you conduct pretests for your tool? Um, contact who, sir? Pretests. Oh, pretests, yes, sir. Two, ten participants. Okay. Thank you. May I know your respondents again? Um, the respondents, ma'am? Um, yes. Respondents. Eight, oh, 18 to 30 year old male homosexuals who live in Iloilo City. In Iloilo City? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, what was the lowest uh, educational attainment? Um, some of them were only elementary graduates. Elementary graduates, okay. So now you see the need for the translation of your instrument to Ilongo. Um, 
we considered that, but during the time when we were uh, administering the questionnaire, we also told them to ask us if they didn't understand any of the questions, so we, to help clarify the questions, if anywhere. You, they made clarifications, okay. Um, excuse me, ma'am. They made clarifications, if yes, they didn't understand. Them. Yes, um, regarding some words that may... Need further clarification. Yeah, that may have needed clarifications. Did you have an ethics review? Excuse me, I'm not. <laughs> Pardon? Ethics. Did you submit it to the, the ethics review board? Oh, yes, ma'am, we did. Mm -mm. And how did you get your participants? Um, it was actually through snowball sampling. So we started with our own friends who fit the criteria, and we asked if they knew other um, people who could fit the criteria that we could give the questionnaire to. So, so what was your sampling design? Snowball. Um, it's, it's, it's a technique, that's not a design. Oh. So uh, answer me whether it's uh, one kind of a probability sampling design or a non-probability sampling design. Oh. Which among those? Non-probability, ma'am. Non-probability, specifically what? Snowball sampling. It's not snowball. Snowball <laughs> is a technique in gathering the information, but oh. design in you know, looking into or selecting your participants. Oh, purposive? Purposive. Good. Purposive. You're correct. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, okay. I'd, Thank you. I'd like to clarify on your participants. So, uh, male having sex with male, am I right? Yes, ma'am. Uh -uh. So, how did you ascertain that they were really MSMs? Um, before, uh, um, regardless of referral from our other friends, we would ask them before we administered the question if ever they identified as male homosexual or a male who has sex with males. Self-disclosure. Yes, ma'am. What specific question did you ask? Um, we were like, um, not to sound offensive or this, we don't mean like, to sound offensive. You have to but, tell us what question yeah. you asked. Um, we're we trying asked, to validate your selection of okay. participants. We asked them like specifically, do you identify as a male homosexual. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> For the most part. Uh, um, one more question. Um, in your result, you mentioned that uh, attitude has no relationship with uh, intention. Oh, it says that there is a strong relationship, ma'am. In what manner? Um, that attitude has a substantial influence on someone's what, intention. What kind of relationship? Oh, it is substantial. <laughs> is it substantial? Positive I'm sorry, but strong, or negative? strong Direction oh, positive, of the I'm relationship? Uh, a, a positive relationship. Okay, thank sorry. you. <laughs> Birds. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I just would like to know uh, what statistical tool did you use to correlate the two uh, the three variables that you have? Oh, um, for mean, yeah, for mean and the distribution tables, we used SPSS. No, no, the the tool, uh, statistical tool. Did you use Pearson R, Spearman? Oh, for the relationships here, yes. gamma for all of uh, the gamma. relationships. Okay, so you made use of the term relationship, but in your conclusion, you made use of the word influence. I think uh, kindly check the, the thing because they are different that, okay. uh, from one another, okay? okay uh, please, if they are related with one another, it's different that one variable influence the other variable. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Are we Again, congratulations. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, researchers. That ends the video presentation. The results will be announced tomorrow during the awarding ceremony. Thank you very much.
At this point, may we call on Dr. Charlie D. Baldon. Dr. Baldon. Is Dr. Baldon. May we call on Dr. Charlie D. Baldon for the presentation of the Certificate of Appreciation for our judges. The certificate reads, Central Philippine University College of Nursing and CCI Nurses Alumni Association present this Certificate of Appreciation to Mrs. Agnes June L. Custodio for sharing her time and expertise as judge during the video presentation, Second International Nursing Conference on Translational Research with the theme from bench to bedside, improving outcomes of care in surgical and transplant clients through translational research and quality improvement initiatives. Signed, Professor Anneli D. Hilongos, the President, CCINAA. Signed, Attorney Salex E. Alibuga, Dean, College of Nursing. This same certificate of appreciation is given to Dr. Rudolf Seymour Kirby P. Martinez. Yes, Paul. The same certificate goes to Dr. Rosana Grace Bello de Lariarte. The same certificate reads for Dean Sofia Cosette Monteblanco and Mr. Doroteo S. Dizan. Would like to request the judges on stage for picture taking. Do we have the contestants for video presentation? Please join the picture taking on stage. Mr. Helandoni, the group of Gesto et al. Professor Brasa, the group, uh, the group of Mantequilla et al. and Makairan et al. Moms and sirs, mapapicture lang ang participants. Moms and sirs, aglit lang po ang participants. Participants, come, on, come up on stage na quicker.
That formally closes our video presentation contest. Other sessions for podium presentation is still ongoing at the LDT building. If you're interested to uh, participate, you can proceed to the LDT building. The next part of the program will resume tomorrow. Thank you very much for your participation.